Hello and welcome to this HDB webinar on growth control on ornamentals. I'm Wayne Brough, HDB Knowledge Exchange Manager, and today's webinar covers some of the practical aspects from two ongoing HDB projects. The first is the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre, uh, and one of the work packages within this project is assessing new potential plant growth regulator products for use on bedding and pot plants. The second is PO22, which is a project looking at the potential of deficit irrigation techniques on poinsettia. The overall aim of these two projects is to sort of A, to try and maintain the number of PGRs available in the short term to industry, while in the longer term, uh, B, to develop chemical free techniques uh, for, for uh, growth control. Before I introduce uh, our key speakers uh, this evening, uh, just a number of housekeeping uh, issues, points to go through, especially for those new to webinars. Uh, from the icons, you will see that uh, the actual presentation today, all the audience is in, in, in mute uh, throughout, but you will be able to uh, contact and um, exchange uh, comments with uh, the today's speakers via two uh, methods. The first uh, is uh, questions, and I'll cover how to ask questions in a moment. And the second uh, is uh, we, we are undertaking three quick polls in the second webinar uh, to, to get your feedback on the questions posed. And again, I'll cover that in a moment in, on the next slide. The actual webinar today is will last around about an hour, give or take five minutes. Um, if you do need to leave, or if colleagues need to see this and are not in attendance, uh, the entire webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to access uh, the webinar next week on the HDB website. There's also three documents I need to go through, and I'll show you how to get those on the next slide. But one is the slide handout, one is the basis form, and one is the Neuroso form if you're collecting points. So uh, just to go through the handouts, polls, and um, the actual accessing and, and posing questions. Um, what you'll see on the right hand side, hopefully, is something that resembles uh, the menu for the GoToWebinar on your own particular screen. If you need to minimize the menu, please click on the red button with the white arrow at the top and that should minimize it, leaving the four icons. Before you do so, just to sort of say, if you wish to pose a question, go down to the third gray bar, click on the white downward arrow uh, that will expand the box and you will see you'll be able to enter a question for the presenters there. Please enter, the, enter any questions throughout the, the webinar and I will keep an eye on said questions and I will pose them at the end of the presentation and also if we have time at the end of the webinar and hopefully the, the, the speakers will be able to answer them in, in due course. The second uh, grey bar is the one concerning the handout. So again, if you press the downward white arrow key, it should expand the box to show three documents uh, contained within that box. The first is the actual handout. So if you want a copy of all the slides from today's presentation, then please feel free to download that and print it or, or whatever, whatever you need to do with it. The other two are the basis and the Rosso forms. Uh, if you are collecting point, points for either of those, please download them, complete them, and send them back to Maya. Her email address is on the bottom of each uh, for you to send it back. As I said before, there will be three quick polls uh, which are planned for the second webinar, uh, which is Mark's. Uh, Mark will pose a question and they'll, uh, on, on the screen, there will be a multiple choice of, of, of responses. Please click whichever uh, uh, response you feel more favorable with and then we'll have a, a quick uh, resume uh, in terms of uh, show of hands and, and percentage, et cetera, as to which, which of the responses was the most popular. And as I said before, the recording will be made available next week on the HDB uh, Horticulture Events webpage, and the, 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 the link is there if, if you need to make a note of it at any point. Just a quick uh, few words about the program and content. Uh, Jill is at first talking about the evaluation of new uh, PGRs for use in ornamentals and, and Mark will then uh, cover the commercial application of water deficit irrigation uh, in ornamentals. I'm sure most people know both Jill and, and Mark but just to say, say a few words about each. Uh, Jill is a consultant with ADAS specializing, specializing in ornamentals She's been involved with the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre since its inception, undertaking numerous trials. 
Mark is a plant physiologist with NIAB EMR and water deficit irrigation has been of interest for Mark for many years and he's done work not only uh, with uh, ornamentals but also with a range of fruit crops including strawberries as well. So if I can ask Mark just to uh, switch his webcam off and uh, mute, I will now pass over to Jill for the first presentation on uh, PGI use in ornamentals. So over to you now, Jill, thank you. Okay, show my screen. Right, here we go. So, oh. Hang on. That's it. So, um, yeah, so this work that we've been carrying out over a period of three years at the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre, this was done by myself, but also David Torbert and Chloe Whitesider aid us, and we had input and advice from Chris Mead and Harry Kitchener. So to start off with a bit of background, as I said, this is a programme of work that's been carried out over three years at the Bedding and Pot Plant Centre. The purpose of the work was to make sure that we could find some new products that growers could use as PGRs on, on their plants. And to, because we had, we, sorry, facing the loss of um, many of the Clormaquat products and also some of the emus that we did have were being renewed, but with the approvals were not as good as they were previously. For example, Stabilan 750, now we can only apply two treatments per, per crop, but also that's at half the rate that we used to be able to use. The other thing that we've been looking at is the stage that we're applying the products at. So we thought we'd try and apply them earlier, so at cotyledon stage and at plug stage, because then you're applying it over a smaller area, cropping area, and it will take less time, less cost in terms of the amount of product that you're using. So those are the premises that we started this work on. Over the course of this work, we've looked at this range of uh, PGR products. You'll be quite familiar with them. In this slide here, I've grouped them and you may have heard me say this before. I hear we've got them grouped in terms of the chlorquat type products are at the top. So that's ca uh, canopy, stablan and turple. Turple also has ethophon. Now this is a uh, active that within the plant, it breaks down to produce ethylene. So that throws up a number of questions. It should help in terms of increasing branching in the plants, which could be a positive or a negative, depending on your, whether you're producing uh, bedding plants or Ponsettia, you wouldn't want secondary growth on Ponsettia particularly. Um, it also could have implications in terms of um, bud or um, sciathia drop. We haven't seen problems with either of those, I must say, across the course of these um, trials. The next grouping are, is products uh, that come within the triazole group, so that's your bonsai, your pirouette, but also in this case, topaz, which is penconazole. Things to look out for, bonsai and pirouette, we know these are very strong products. You do need to make sure that you check your emus. You can see from this slide that uh, the bonsai we're using under label approval. You also need to make sure that you look at the label for this. The label says that it should be applied as a spray application only and make sure that the product does, isn't applied to runoffs. So you want to avoid it running off into the compost or onto the capillary matting because you can get root uptake. It's strongly root taken up by roots. Therefore, and it will adhere to the growing media and to the capillary matting. So you could find that follow on crops could be affected or you may just get a much stronger effect on the crop that you are growing. Topaz, we've Oh, yeah, no, the other thing I meant to say was pirouette, again, on the label, this is for foliar application, but there is an emu that will allow you to apply drenches, which uh, you need for later on in these trials that I'm going to talk about. Topaz we've included here, it's a fungicide. We've included it because we want to look at crop safety, on, particularly on um, poncetias, where you might want to use it because it's effective against powdery mildew. Again, take care to look at the emu for this one. Um, it is slightly different. 
one thing that's, that's come up in recent years is a lot of these products on their emus, you can only use them under permanent protection with full size side enclosures. Topaz has got two different comments on this. You've got one rate for if you do have um, full enclosure, which is a higher number of um, applications, you can make four applications a year. But if you're in a polytunnel, you can only make two. So you do need to make sure that you check the emus. And another thing that I haven't seen before is that with Topaz, um, you mustn't be applying it to products that don't have leaves. So, yeah, don't know quite where that's come from, but that's that's on the Topaz um, emu. Dazide, Diminazide, um, that is well known. So this group is slightly less active, so you, you'll find a much that you get a much gentler effect. Things like days I do is uh, more costly. I do have a costing slide towards the end, so you'll be able to check that out for yourselves. Primo, Max and Modas, same active, but different formulations, um, different rates in the formulations. So they, they do act quite differently. Modas, you can only apply one, make one application to the crop. So use it judiciously. Primo, Max, we have found that you can get some phytotoxicity, but you'll see um, about that a bit later on. Regardless Plus, again, for this one, we have found phytotoxicity in previous trials and this one. So um, that is something that we'll look at as we go through, but it, it can be effective and it can be a useful product in the right place and on the right plant. Control, this is another product, although it's called Control. It's produced by Growth Design. And that's been found useful for growers, and it it does it, it is able to uh, control some growth, as you'll see. It's a seaweed-based product, so it, it um, has other effects as well. But we will talk about that later. Stena is an adjuvant that we've used uh, in a number of trials, and we, it's useful to try with um, chlormaquat type products. So all of those products that you see in the top grouping. It should be, well, it is effective with Stabilan, it is effective with Turpal, and you'll see about uh, Canopy later on. Um, the other thing that I was going to say about Stena, um, it can be a little bit pricey, but again, it depends what, it's a relative thing, and it depends on what you're comparing it with. So we'll see about that later on. You can, you wouldn't expect this to be effective with Bonsai or Pirouette, but it is effective if it's used with Dazide Enhanced, so it will they allow you to reduce the rate of Dazide that, you, that you're applying. So let's go. First trial that we're going to look at is bedding plants at cotyledon stage. Now, for this, we applied the treatments as drenches at 10% of the tray volume. We then transplanted the plants into jumbo six plaques and we kept them going until flowering so you could see if there was any um, petal bleach that, that came out later on. The rates that we used for this, we, we took from pre previous trials that we had carried out so that we knew that they would be good rates to use on Dianthus. Cosmos and the French Marigold were new to the trial this year, but we just kept the same rates for everything and um, hoped that they would be, be successful. Okay, so from this trial then, we found, found PGRs effective that wouldn't need any follow-up treatment. So I guess this is the sort of um, application time. So it's at cotyledon stage. It's just, you can see those cotyledons that we applied the, the treatments. So you may find that your um, young plant producer, if you're using plugs, has already applied a treatment that might be along these lines in which case for when you're applying later, you do need to know, you know what they have already applied. They could apply applied something like pirouette and that could affect later treatments. So because we found with this that we didn't need to apply follow-up treatments for some of these uh, products. We did find for Cosmos that um, there was a slight delay in flowering for, for the, in the canopy and the pirouette treatments also modus on the dianthus and turple on the french marigold but it was just slightly fewer 
flowers produced in those treatments and in those um, subjects. So you can see here some other photos. Now these are project products. We tried these ones. They didn't. They weren't quite so effective, but there is room for maneuver because we used sort of quarter and half rates. So you could perhaps try them with a higher rate and you might find that there's better efficacy. We didn't get any phytotoxicity in the regardless used in this trial. You can see that there's a slight difference in the number of flowers. The, the pack on the left, that's the control, so that's had water only applied. The pack on the right in each of these photos is the treated plant. So for the modus, we've got fewer flowers, same with the regardless, same with the turtle. So there is that slight delay. Um, you can see um, a little bit of height control, but, but not very much at these rates. So Daydide Enhance, we tried this on the Dianthus and the Cosmos, but it wasn't effective. We applied at the full label rate, so six grams per litre. So there isn't any room for manoeuvre on the label on the rate that we applied. You can't increase the rate at all, so really isn't worth trying this. I mean, you could say, OK, you can apply that in a follow up treatment, but I don't think there's little benefit to that. Treatments not recommended. Um, so in this first set of photos, the Prima Maxis treatment is on the left and you can see there's some petal bleach and the foliage also is um, uh, less green than in the water only control, which is on the right. For the turple the, on the dianthus, we got some little white spots on the petals. So again, we wouldn't recommend that treatment. So moving on to the pre and post transplant plant spray programs. Now here we um, introduced some different plants. Again, for this trial, Cosmos was new to the trial program. Osteospernum we had used in the year previous, also Dianthus and the Pelagonian Horizon. They weren't new. We introduced a new treatment. So we have sprays, we have sprenches, which were at five, applied at 5% of the cell or pot volume, and the drenches at 10%. So you're putting less product on the sprenches with the sprenches. So you can see how those panned out. The applications were made two days pre-transplant, seven days post-transplant, and then we followed up with another treatment 10 days later, but only if that was required. And um, we applied the the, the product in 300 litres of water, as we generally do for these trials. Now, effective spray programmes for Cosmos. Um, yeah, we've got some pretty good programmes here that were pretty um, effective. Um, the pirouette for, for Cosmos, we went for pirouette as the pre-transplant sprench, so that's 5% of pot volume. Um, because we wanted something, we know that Cosmos is a vigorous plant and we wanted something that we knew that would be pretty effective. And you'll also notice that the post-transplant treatments are at quite high rates, for the, particularly for the pirouette. But again, it was effective and that was what, you know, what we found was needed. Um, yeah, so we've got a range of treatments that were successful here. The regardless, we didn't get any um, phytotoxicity from that applied at that rate as the post-transplant treatment. Um, yeah, so it, it was a pretty tr successful trial in that we've come out with some programs that you could potentially use. In terms of the cost of the programs, um, well, we know that pirouettes um, are relatively cheap. The products, like Canopy and, um, it's not in here, but the Primo Max that were developed for use in cereals, they tend to be pretty um, less expensive as well, just because they're produced in really large volumes and that gets the price, the price down. Things like Regalis, which is produced more for the ornamentals market, you find the price is much higher. So, for example, if you take this Regalis price at 4.17 grams per litre, that will cost you 51p to apply. Whereas the canopy at 2.25 grams per litre, that's going to cost you 5p. So there's quite a range there. Turple is another product that's relatively inexpensive. Um, but this 6.67 uh, 
mils per litre application costs around uh, 12p to apply. That's just in terms of the, the product alone, of course, you know, the time and everything, it's all on top of that. Um, so these are some pictures of the treatments that we've just been discussing. So um, this is pirouette plug scrunch followed by the treatments that you can see here. Um, yeah, and where you've got the times two, you had two treatments of those. You can see again, for some of these treatments where um, there was an effect on flowering, some that some were fine, perfectly fine. Um, they all look, I, I think the exposures, it's a very bright day, so the plants look quite pale in that, in that respect. Um, again, for these, the uh, water only controls on the left. Um, so the one treatment that we don't recommend is the Primo Max 2. We got petal bleach at two litres per hectare for the Primo Max. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend going ahead with that one. Now, Dianthus, we had three programmes that were successful for this. Um, here we tried, we had pirouette sprays, pirouette drenches and turple drenches as, a, on the, as the plug treatments all of which worked out fine. We didn't get any phyto in these treatment, in these programs at all. Um, in terms of a uh, number of flowers, it was treatment three with the pirouette, which is at the, um, it, where we've got the drench. The drench, I think maybe was slightly strong and could have been, if you want to use a drench, it's slightly strong. You might want to adjust that rate down a little bit. Um, just because it delayed the flowering, and you'll see effect, the effect on the plant height in a minute. But I guess really a spray application would be the less expensive one in terms of time and so on to use. So that that treatment too, the first treatment, might be the one that's a bit more attractive from a grower point of view. Um, Turple, again, we applied it as a drench in the plug treatment, but it was pretty effective at the rates that we, that we applied at. And no phytotoxicity, of course. Um, so you can see here what I was talking about with um, the pirouette treatments. It's the photograph in the middle, which had the plug drench. And you can see there is some slight yellowing of, of the foliage. It's the uh, pack on the right hand side there that we're looking at. Water only is on the left hand side. Um, so a slightly lower um, application rate or drench rate might have been better for that treatment. But you can play around with the rates and you know always on your nursery the rates could be different depending on your growing conditions etc etc so it's all worth, always worth trying on a few plants before you go for something like this on the whole of your crop uh, Jill, um, Jill, just to mention you've you've got 10 minutes so oh you, my you goodness may... i've got lots to get through right effective play pgr programs geranium horizon red um, again we use drenches in the plugs and um uh, yep, we had some really useful treatments. We tried we had tried turple here with Stena, so that's a half a half rate turple compared with the T4, and again that was um, really useful. It meant that we could cut down the rate of the turple that we applied, but it can be a bit more of an expensive um, treatment because um, you know the, the Stena can work out a little bit more expensive. Um, so that's that's treatment. That, that program with the Stenner in would have cost 11p overall in terms of the uh, pro products that you're using, whereas without the Stenner, 7.2p and the final treatment, 14p. So there is a bit of a dif difference there. And these are photos of those treatments. Although you can't really see much difference in the plant height, there is a difference in the treat T2 compared with the untreated control. Um, and you can see that the spread of the plants is much less, they're more compact and they're more solid plants, they're not soft and, and wavy. And we also had some good zoning on there. We did look at modus in this program as well as um, a treatment at the plug stage, but we found that the zoning wasn't so good, the plants were much paler, so we uh, took that one out of the recommended treatments. Osteospernum, we had some slight problems with osteo osteos in terms of the um, uh, sowing and germination, we had to re-sow. So these, this set of trials was carried out in slightly shortening day lengths and lower light levels. So 
uh, maybe it's slight caution with the results. But again, we got some useful uh, treatments here. Canopy worked well with Stena. We got some good height reduction there. Looking at the photos, you can see, yes, yeah, some good height reduction. And in fact, some of these look as though they were slightly stronger and perhaps, again, playing with some rates might be a good way to go. But, um, you know, growing at the correct time of year then, uh, or, you know, uh, earlier in the year, we might have had some better results with some more flowers. So potentially with some adjust adjustment, again, the turple treatments were too strong and, um, yeah, adjustment and try again. So looking at these um, products on other bedding plant subjects, um, so other work was done by HTC that Wayne carried out in previous years, but also some work was carried out in Denmark. And so I've drawn on those to get to look at um, other products that were successful on bedding plants, uh, other sub bedding plant subjects that the products were successful on. So canopy on, um, uh, was successful on pansy and bacopa and potted roses, modus on salvia mohave, but limited, limited effect of modus on empatias and petunia. So we're getting mixed results with the modus. Um, and Primo Max came out here with um, no effect on pansy and argyranthemum. So um, again, mixed results. And of course, Primo is one where we've seen some phytotoxicity on the um, cosmos. Regardless, plus we know that we've seen um, petal bleach on this in previous trials, uh, particularly on the Dahlia, Begonia and Verbena. And in our trials, we had crop damage on the Begonia, but I think we were um, applying it as a drench at that point, and it was literally just too strong. Um, turple, so turple is in the same group as uh, Clormaquat, so your Stabilans, and we expect it to work in a very similar way as I mentioned before. So a useful product, particularly if you're growing something like geraniums and you want um, to increase branching early in production. We did look at Xanthodesia early in our first year of trials, and we found that turple was the only product that was really effective, particularly when applied as a drench. Um, in that year, we used Activator 90 with the treatment, so that could be useful for people producing Xanthodesia. Now, Senna, Stena, efficacy is increased when applied with Stabilan and turple. Um, it's also effective with uh, Deminazide products, so Dazide and um, Enhanced, Dazide Enhanced, so yeah, and it's also effective with other Clomaquot products. Um, and it's effective on a range of um, uh, plants. So it has been trialled more extensively in the Netherlands, where it's marketed as Elasto G5 and it's Surfer Plus. If you go to their website, you can pick up lots of information about it. Um, so we've been talking about costs as we've gone through, so I won't labour on this, but if you do uh, download the presentation, you can have a play around with the costs yourselves. Now, Ponsetia. Um, again, an interesting range of trials. This year for the Ponsetia, we've looked more at um, application programmes. So um, slightly different than in previous years. Again, we've used track it, graphic tracking to guide when we make applications. Um, so we applied treatments from um, week 39, and in th on the 30th of October, we applied a holding spray of, spray of bonsai, bonsai. Okay, so a series of programs using Stabilan 750 and Turple. So here we played around with which product we applied first in the program and which second. So sometimes you'll see the two applications of Stena only, but applied first, then three applications of Turple afterwards. In all of these programs, we made five applications. Um, we also used Stena and uh, Stabilan and Stena, sorry, Stabilan and Turple with Stena. So that was quite useful. And you'll see about that, some photos of that a little bit later. Um, we also looked at Stabilan with bonsai. Okay, we didn't come up with any, didn't have any crop damage, comparable number of heads with all treatments, all programs and um, certainly scores, there were no difference and all plants within the height spec. Um, so what we did find though, was that where Stabilan was applied earlier 
or early in the program, we had larger brats than when it was followed by turpal. One of the things with turpal in earlier trials where we've used it at higher rates, we found that we did get smaller brats. And, you know, depending on, you know, what rate the rate was at much higher rates, then we, we had some quite um, hard plants that we managed to produce. But anyway, turpal for uh, Stabilan first looks like a, a good move. Um, and it'll also help to shape the plants, of course. We made that late application of bonsai. That photograph on the right hand side there, you can see um, that was just before the week before we made that application. So we were getting some black cut bract colouring then, and we had no phyto from that. So bonsai is a useful product to apply late in the programme without fear of um, phytotoxicity. Now, this is a slide where I'm showing that we've used the turple with and without Stena, and you can see water only control on the left hand side and um, we got quite similar height reduction with half the rate of turbo when we use the Stena. What you need to look at of course and you'll make a decision for yourselves on whether or not you think it would be cost effective to do that it's just um, about whether you know you've got to the point where you can't apply any more Stena and you need to reduce the rates so you know you, you need to decide that for yourselves, depending on, you know, where you are with your applications. Um, bonsai, this was an interesting one. So we made, we had three treatments of bonsai, five applications, in each case we made five applications, but we um, had an application rate of bonsai at 0.35 mils a litre, another at 0.5 mils a litre, both of those were in 300 litres per hectare of water, but then we used a lower rate in a higher uh, water rate and you can see that that higher water rate had a much stronger effect than the same um, concentration at a lower rate. The only difference was literally the amount of water per hectare that we were applying. So I guess that you're applying more water and within that water you've got um, uh, you know the same the same amount of bonsai. So you're actually applying more bonsai. This is what it actually means. So that's uh, given a greater effect. When you're applying bonsai, as I mentioned before, if you're applying it quite early in the program, certainly before you've got uh, pot cover, then or leaf cover, then you know there is the potential if you apply at too high a rate for it to drop off onto uh, the uh, any capillary matting or grain media, and that could mean that you get a much stronger effect. So you do really need to take care of that. Um, so control the seaweed-based fertilizer. It was crop safe, um, comparable quality, slightly fewer heads than the water only control, but you can see that it did reduce the, um, uh, the height of the plants compared to the water. Uh, now this trial, we didn't replicate this trial, so there was only um, one plot for, it, for, for each of these um, treatments. We play the five mils per litre is the label rate, 10 mils a litre is the double raised label rate, just to try and see where the cutoff is for phyto. We didn't get any. Um, one thing though that I will say about control is that the producer has said that you can use it on bedding plants. Uh, so that is a useful thing to know as well, but you might want to reduce the rates if you do try to go down that route because it there is the potential for scorch on really soft growth so you do need to take some care with it and don't go crazy we have had some sort of grower experience feedback about control where they've used it in a tank mix with uh, stabilan and maybe with a wetter as well maybe something like uh activator 90 um, and that can and, and the control also increased the efficacy of the PGR. But like everything, you would need to try that on products, on plants, on your own nursery, so make sure you don't get any um, nasty surprises. Okay. Um, topaz, we introduced this this year, but as a crop safety screen, um, it's something that you would use on powdery mildew. What we did find that it didn't really have any, well, it didn't have any effect on um, plant height. Again, we didn't have any replication um, in this trial, um, particularly at um, one of the treatments here is the five mils per litre. That's the double dose rate. We just tried that again to just at the um, higher limits to um, test that crop safety. We didn't get any um, 
we didn't get any phytotoxicity. Um, check out, uh, we've got another webinar next week where we're looking at foliar diseases on bedding and we're speaking there about the trial that we've carried out on bedding plants with topaz, again, screening for crop safety. And that was, um, we, we had similar results there with no problems. Not recommended on Ponsettia. Um, you will have seen these in pre from previous years. We didn't try them last year. Um, Canopy, Primo Max, severe phytotoxicity. We reduced the rate of, as far as we could. Um, you know, you get to the point where there's no uh, height control and you're still getting some phytos, so it's not really worth using it. And similarly, with Regalis, we tried it at different rates and we still managed to get some um, BRAC bleaching. Um, these are the costs. Um, so again, you can have a look at those yourself because I'm probably right out of time. Uh, what else have I got here? A few reminders for you. Things I've probably said quite a lot here. Check what, check what PGRs were applied by your young plant su supplier. And if you're thinking of going on and using Pirouette or Bonsai, um, you might need to adjust your application rates because that can be um, you know, quite persistent, particularly if it's been applied at a higher rate. Um, the new products that we've used, like the Turple, the Vimo, the Modus, they're all very strong. And we found, particularly when we made drench applications, we've had to keep cutting back and cutting back the rates that we've been using that. So keep that in mind. Although you've got an EMU rate, don't just go ahead and use that. Try some lower rates as well. Test on a few plants before large, large scale use. And the EMUs that we've got coming now, they've they're all different and they've all got different caveats on so make sure you're aware of what they're telling you that you can and can't do because otherwise all of this is at your own risk if you're applying under an EMU and you might get some surprises that you really don't want to find or to have and I think that's the end of it um oh yes I've put some um fact sheets on there for you and I've added one in there which is this one about uh simple and effective nursery trials I thought that might be useful it's one that we haven't really spoken about I don't think for a long time but it is useful and I think the way to go when you're trying these new products is to have a corner of your nursery where you're going to try out some new things every year and that might point you in the right direction to that and give you confidence to do that sort of thing um, and acknowledgements. Thank you very much to all of these people that have um, either hosted trials um, for us, apply, apply, provided us with um, plugs and plants and general support, um, but also some of the um, manufacturers who've uh, uh, provided us with their products to use in the trials. Um, any questions? Right then, Jill, uh, we're running a little bit late, but I Sorry. think I will just 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 pose a couple of them uh, just to make sure um, Mark has sufficient time for his presentation. Uh, I've got a question here about how does a sprench treatment differ from a conventional drench treatment? It, it's literally just the amount that we've, um, we're applying. So generally the rule of thumb if you're applying a drench treatment is that you're applying 10 percent of the pot or cell volume so for the sprench it's really like um a heavy spray but it's not as heavy as a drench so there we're talking about five percent of the cell volume so it's just um i think it's quite useful because i think growers do do that they do apply something that they call a sprench and this perhaps is a little bit of guidance just so that you can um, judge in your mind how much you're applying work it out for a few plants and then use that against on the rest against the rest of or on the rest of the crop and just just one more <clears throat> in terms of regalis is yeah. is there a possibility of either an early application or a late application uh, to avoid the flower bleach in embedding plants Oh, embedding plants. Okay, I was going to. Um, we did use it quite early in one of the treatments, didn't we? Um, yeah. So uh, if we go back, we can. Sorry, I'm not going to take loads of time on this. You can see. I think it was on. Yeah, here Burnham. So not the best example, I must say. Um, but we've used, we've tried it early on the Osseus Burnham. And there we didn't get any problems. So I would say it depends. It's going to be different for different um, 
plant species. So we used it at the plug straight plug sorry plug stage here as a spray we also used it as that post transplant sprench so at those two stages we didn't get any phytotoxicity coming through but i think you would have i've always already flagged up plants where we have seen phytotoxicity so avoid those and i would say perhaps you just need to do a little bit of trial and error and trial try them on a few plants there is that potential we went down that route a bit with the um setia we were applying that right through the program and we were looking at you know over applications of six um treatments to see when any phytotoxicity did occur and we found that it didn't really occur or we didn't start seeing it early on in that program, but it could just be that we saw it later and that was a build up of applications that brought that out in the plants. Certainly with Primo and um, Canopy, we were seeing the phytotoxicity, phytotoxicity coming out in, in the form of paler petioles on the plants relatively early in the application. So we didn't see that, I must say, on the regardless, but then, they didn't affect the positive as severely so i think trial and error okay thank you jill if yeah. if we draw if we draw a line there in fairness to mike uh yeah so if, if if i can ask jill to sort of uh go on to mute and close our webcam and ask mark if he's uh, got his presentation prepared and we'll move over to mark for a presentation on the application of, of rdi in uh, ornamental plant production thank you mark Okay, good. Thank you, Wayne. And um, yes, good evening, everyone. And so um, I'm going to talk mainly about some of the results from our ongoing AHDB project. Um, but I'll also refer to more recent AHDB projects and, and really back to 2004 when we first started doing this work uh, in a project funded uh, at the time by DEFRA. So just really to explain what we mean by uh, plant water deficits and how we use those as a non-chemical form of plant growth control. So first of all, what we're trying to do then is to impose a very mild stress onto the plants. And so um, it, at a particular stage of development, so we can invoke the, the hormone signaling within the plant to try to help to limit stem extension. And although the focus here is, is uh, on growth control, I'll just mention at the end that there are other benefits that we can um, achieve using regulated deficit irrigation. Um, as I say, I'll mention those at the end. So this is just a sort of a quick overview of what we'll cover during the next 20, 20 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, before we begin, assuming that, that hopefully many of you are, are at least familiar with RDI and uh, why we're trying to use and develop RDI as a, as a non-chemical growth control, um, we'd like to run the first poll question. Um, which is, uh, as the audience, what, what barriers do you see uh, to implementing RDI on your nursery and how, um, what do we need to overcome in order uh, for you to feel confident in, in doing so? So Mark, Mark can't probably see this screen. So for the benefit of the audience, you've got a number of options there. We'll leave this on the screen for the next 20 seconds. So if you if you if you could please select one and, and submit and then we'll <coughs> announce the results in a, a few seconds uh, just to make uh, Mark aware of the response. Thank you. Good. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Right then, Mark. Um, the, the thing that seems to be the most popular is the one more feedback is needed from growers. Excellent. Okay, good. That's, right, thank you all. That's, that's, that's got twice the vote of any other response. Very good. Thank you all. That, that's, that's very helpful. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, why apply RDI? Well, primarily the reason is to, um, to help to limit plant height uh, without reliance on, on pesticides and PGRs. 
but we also see some other advantages and some other benefits and they might include for example better uniformity um, a short and extended shelf life um, perhaps reduce risk of some root rot pathogens and some pests and of course improve resource use efficiency um, and again it's really about understanding how to use data and technology to help inform your decision making so we'll go on to the next slide so you'll see here some some graphs you may have seen before and this is data that was collected at marcel frank's nursery in stablehurst last year and so on the left you have the um you can see the upper and lower height limits for the poinsettia crop you'll see the uh, hopefully the symbols in blue is the is the commercial control and you'll notice there there are those uh those black arrows just near the x-axis so they are the timings of the of the plant growth regulator sprays that that uh, that marcel and his team applied to keep the plants within spec last year so you'll see there there was a total of seven sprays applied to the commercial crop if you look at the right hand side then this is the uh, the crop that we were treating with rdi and so you'll see there there's one arrow and that was a, a post pinching spray of pgr just to even out the uh, uh, the breaks and after that then we control growth entirely by applying RDI so there were there were no further plant growth regulator sprays applied um, so so rather than applying seven sprays of course we applied just just once and we used RDI during a specific stage of plant development to control uh, plant height and and we managed to achieve height specifications at the end of the year despite only using one uh, plant growth regulator spray. So a very uh, effective method, non-chemical method of uh, plant growth control. And of course the problem is, is we know that poinsettia is a shade avoiding plant. And so when it's, manu it's, it's grown under those high density conditions, its natural tendency of course is to stretch. And so the action of many of the plant growth regulators that Jill talked about earlier, of course, is by interfering with the the synthesis or the perception of, of, um, of the plant hormone group gibberellins and so what we're trying to do then is impose a stress to the plants to to alter the internal hormone signaling system so we can begin to counteract the effects of these gibberellins and um, whether uh, for example some of the stresses we uh, uh, tend to apply they they elevate concentrations of abscisic acid and ethylene and it may be the interaction of these two hormones then that helps to uh, helps to reduce the uh, promotive effect of gibberellin so what we're trying to do is alter the plant hormone balance by applying these uh, these sorts of stresses so um these were taken on the 8th of november last year at marcel's nursery so you'll see there there's um, two photographs one is the commercial control and this is the crop that was sprayed seven times last year and then one is the RDI crop, which was sprayed only once. And so um, hopefully you'll agree those plants, uh, those two photographs look very similar. And so, OK, which ones are the plants that have been treated with RDI and which ones have been sprayed seven times? Um, well, to tell you, the RDI plants are the photograph in the right. And so you can see they're hopefully very similar at dispatch in terms of quality to the commercial controls. So, so no detrimental effects of applying this, this mild stress technique on quality of dispatch. So of course, what we're interested in also then is how we can help to assure and extend shelf life potential. So after the experiment at Marcel's uh, last year, we, um, we sleeved and boxed the plants and then we took them up to the new shelf life room at uh, Neem Lee. And so they were, the plants were left sleeved in the shelf life room, unboxed and then put into shelf life testing. So the plants were first put in the shelf life room on the 8th of November last year, and it was a blind test. And what we mean by that is there were two groups of plants. One was the commercial control that had received the sprays. The other was the RDI treated plants. And we randomized the plants within the shelf life and, and it was a blind test. So only, only my colleague, Mike Davis and me knew which plants had come from which treatment. And so the team at Neem Lee then started to score the the changing quality over the shelf life testing. And you'll see here the photographs were taken just a couple of weeks after uh, after the plants have been taken to the shelf life room. And you can begin to see already some, some, some leaf drop on some of the pots. And you'll see in the photograph on the bottom right there, the plant on the right looks to be of lower quality than the plant on the left. 
and so we're very keen to to really see if we could confirm our earlier findings from from the DEFRA work way back in 2006 2007 uh, that RDI did indeed confer a sort of uh, increased tolerance to the stresses that we encounter, the plants encountered during shelf life. And so there are four graphs here then. Um, we tracked the, uh, the loss of leaves, which you can see in the top left hand corner, and the loss of bracts, and the uh, development of the Cyathea over that time, and also then an overall plant quality score. And you'll see there the blue lines are, are, the, are the blue bars are the commercial crop that, that received the, uh, the seven sprays, and the red lines then are the RDI treated plants. So, and you'll see there quickly within two or three weeks is a clear difference between the number of leaves that were falling from the commercial control and then also from, from the RDI. And you can see that pattern is very similar, even more pronounced if we look at the, uh, at the abscission of the bracts. Um, you can see the RDI treatment there delayed sciatic development uh, and up, up, up for a certain point. And you can see the overall then the subjective analysis of the overall quality of the plants. And you can see generally that the uh, rate of deterioration in quality was, was slowed by pre-treating the plants with RDI compared to the commercial control. And so you'll see by the end of the shelf life testing there then, um, eight weeks in shelf life test, which was early early January this year, um, you'll see there then that the, the, the overall quality of the RDI treated plants was deemed to be uh, greater than the quality of the commercial control. And again, just to highlight, these, all of these plants were grown at Marcel's nursery. So at the, uh, at the Poinsettia Day earlier this year in, in uh, January, we uh, invited the attendees to come and look at the plants. And so um, this is a photograph of the commercial control plants. Uh, eight weeks after or after eight week shelf life. And one of the growers commented that, that uh, these plants would fail the wheelie bin test. And so, so obviously I asked what the wheelie bin test was. And, and this then is a, um, a test that the grower uses in his house and he has to convince his family that the poinsettia are only now fit for the wheelie bin. And so at this time, the plants would, would pass the wheelie bin test and they'd be uh, disposed of. He said he'd have quite a difficult job in trying to persuade his family then that the RDI treated plants at that time would only be fit for the wheelie bin. So you can see there are clear, uh, a, a clear improvement in quality or, or a, a, a clear slowing in the rate of deterioration of quality. And don't forget these, these plants were treated in, um, uh, in September time and October. And so that this beneficial effect of the treatment then is we're starting to see this several months later. And so, so the second poll question then, um, bearing in mind that, that RDI has additional benefits in terms of uh, height control, how important is an improvement in shelf life potential uh, to you? I think now the poll is open and so we'll just wait a few, a few moments for you all to reply. I think it's a bit of a no-brainer, Mark, and it's 100% yeah. yes. 100 percent yes. <laughs> Fab, fantastic, good. I'd, I'd hope that would be uh, that would be your answer. Okay, so so we've seen the benefits of the potential of RDI in terms of height control, but also these these benefits we see in terms of shelf life and quality. Uh, and and so the next question might be, okay, well that all sounds very interesting, uh, but but you know where do we where do we start? Where do we begin? So the first thing I would uh, implore you to do is trust in the science. And so, so you'll see the photograph in the top left. So that was the very first trial we set up at Marcel's in 2004. And um, I like to refer to this as Marcel's adventures with scientists. And so his, his adventures began in 2004. And you'll see there, that's a very artificial system, drip lines, drippers, and so on and so forth. And now, of course, 16 years later, we're able to apply uh, highly controlled regulated deficit irrigation uh, across the nursery. So there's been a lot of development in terms of the science, the understanding of the plant science that underpins this work, but also of course a lot of development of some of the some of the technologies. And I think the great um, the great satisfaction I have is that the results we found in 2007, 8, and 9, we're seeing exactly the same results in 2017, 18, and 19. So 
very very consistent results and of course what's changed in that time is the um is the availability of the technology we can use to monitor the crop and so we can receive real-time data from from any nursery within the country this is an example is of some data from from Marcel's collected last year so we can very quickly look at the data and then remotely we can detect when those plants are starting to wilt and so you'll see the photograph of the plants on the on the right hand side there they're, they're probably wilted more than we would wish but but we can tell when the plants are beginning to wilt by looking at those data sets and so um, we can do this remotely and so we can help the growers to to schedule RDI um, uh, remotely and so there's been a lot of advancements in the in the intervening years and that, that's a, a very good example so that's what we can do uh, it's important for you to understand what you can do to help reduce the variability in your growing area and these are probably some things you're already doing at the moment is it's, it's very important to understand the variability in your growing area so then you can understand the impacts that might have on uniformity and quality so some very simple things are your benches level are they clean is 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 the water flow unimpeded around the bench if it's a bench system uh, for all all growing systems is 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 this irrigation system delivering what you expect and so um you'll see there in the in the top top right that that's some data collected at valmari last year and that's just showing you some some of the variability in a floor growing poinsettia crop following an irrigation event so armed with that information then it, it it's actually quite um straightforward to begin to change how you would irrigate those those crops um it's important to to do audits and to test your irrigation system and you might be surprised at how good your irrigation system is and again the photograph on the on the bottom right there is 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 some woodlark and they they're using a drip system and they recently did an audit and it was within plus or minus five percent of the expected value even though it was a you know it wasn't a new system and so it's important to understand how well your irrigation system is working because you're going to need a fairly uniform system in order to be able to impose RDI uh, effectively and safely. And the bottom point there is a very important one. So are the root systems of the plants well developed? So you can see on the on the left hand side there, poinsettia taken last year, nice, nice root system developed. You can see they're applying RDI. So the top of the pot is, is dry. Uh, we're re-wetting re at intervals. It's very important that there's a good strong root system then that's able to take up that water once we irrigate and so again you'll see a close-up of the pot in the middle nice good strong root system able to help the plant recover after we've applied these these mild stress events uh, unfortunately the plant on the right there it's got a quite poor root system poor poor development so that plant would struggle to recover from the stress we're applying even though you can see the substrate is quite damp quite wet there isn't really the root system in place to be able to take up the volume of water that's needed to restore uh, turga in the shoots so a well-developed root system is is absolutely key um okay so that's all good what what equipment will you need well fairly straightforward you need a ruler um if you have an electronic balance to begin to measure plant and pot weights, that, that's very good. You can buy an inexpensive, um, an expensive electronic balance on Amazon or other, other places for 10 or 15 pounds, that, that they give you very useful information and to understand how your crop is changing over the day, but also over the season and, and throughout the imposition of distress. If you wanted, you could then uh, add to that information using a soil moisture sensor, and you'll see a a substrate moisture sensor there provided by Delta T and and if you really wanted to uh, to understand the variability within your crop you could start to use some of these wireless temperature and humidity sensors that you can access via your smartphones just so you understand how the growing conditions uh, um, vary across your particular growing area but the basic equipment you need is a ruler and a pencil and so this is a great resource that's, that's made available by the AHDB. This is the, um, uh, the height tracker um, that, that uh, many growers, I think, now use to track their heights to see where they are in terms of the upper and lower specs. Um, yes, and good evening, Katie. Um, so, so this is a great help for the growers, but of course it's also very helpful for, for us if we're applying RDI to be able to look and see 
the impact of those treatments on on the uh, plant growth. And so that's a great uh, great resource that you can uh, find from the website there at the bottom. Okay, so what to expect? Well, what we're trying to do is impose a mild stress. And I think inevitably, um, if this is new to you, you'll also probably, you and your team, will also experience a mild stress. And so this is just a, a word cloud of, um, of conversations I had with Marcel's team, uh, with, with Martin and Simon and John, uh, last year uh, when we were imposing the RDI treatment. And so. So you can see there some of the um, some of the comments and some of the concerns that that, that the team team had. And this is a photograph you can see on the left there. You'll see those six plants that have been taken off the irrigation bench and allowed to dry. And they've, we've allowed those to dry uh, far more than we would do when we're applying RDI. So uh, we'd expect some wilting, but perhaps not to this extent. So that photograph was taken on Sunday, the 15th of September last year. Uh, we irrigated those plants in probably the mid-afternoon, and you'll see John there holding up one of those plants. It looks like it's a second plant from the left. On Monday morning, absolutely fully recovered. It's it's fine, and so um, mild wilting is what we need. What we need, what we're aiming for, and plants will recover quickly. But the asterisk there is to remind me to just emphasise that that will happen if there's a good uh, a good root system. So uh, what to expect? Well, then um, you're probably going to have to dry the plants and the substrates beyond the point at which you feel comfortable. And the other thing is you're all going to have to agree to do it. And so, so this is an important thing to discuss before you start is, is uh, you'll have to go a little bit further than you might feel comfortable with. Um, but hopefully by the end of this, this uh, sort of a uh, uh, mild stress treatment then, um, these are some of the comments again that, that the team at Marcel's Nursery um, um, were making at, at the end of the RDI period. So, so mild stress, stress can be beneficial. And there's just a link there to a, to a newspaper article um, about U stress. So EU stress, EU is Greek, I think, for good. And so it's an article really about how if the stress is mild, it can be beneficial uh, and um, and productive for, for humans as well as poinsettias. So. Um, if you have time, please do access that article. Okay, so, so very quickly, when and how can we apply RDI on your nursery? When's the best time to do that? Well, the answer is now. So we would normally recommend applying RDI between weeks 38 and week 42, 43, depending on your, on your geographical, geographical location. So we're aiming to apply RDI within the period of exponential growth in the stem. And so that's when we're trying to and manipulate the plant signaling system then to try to uh, limit the effects of these uh, gibberellins on promoting stem height. So, so that's the time to do it. Uh, and you'll see there's some of the, you know, the plant on the bottom there is a, an RDI treated plant where you can see some of the root system is still in drying soil. So it's best to try and avoid uh, very hot weather. This is data that we collected last year from from, from Marcel's, and you'll see there the top graph is the moisture content within the substrate. So we impose RDI gradually, and then we maintain RDI to a certain point until we've received, uh, until we've achieved effective height control, and then we'll rehydrate later on during the season. So you'll see there we really started to take those plants down once the weather uh, dropped cooler towards the end of September and through November. And that's exactly the stage uh, we're at now on the on the crop at Marcel's. So where should you begin? Well, probably the best thing to do is to just to take some of your poinsettia and, and remove them from irrigation. So either from the flood drain, capillary matting or drip and just let them dry for several days and just see how dry are they, how long it takes for them to be sort of severely wilted as you can see there in the plants on the bottom. And so the the graph at the top there is data collected uh, by the team at Neem Lee, and that's exactly what, what they did. They just took the plants off the, off the irrigation um, and, and, and watched them every day and noted the time at the, the, the plants, the date at the time the plants first wilted, which is normally around sort of midday, one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, when the vapor pressure deficit is highest, and also the point at which there was sustained wilting in the morning. And that, that really tells us when the plant is experiencing stress. So that's fairly easy to do. Take some plants off, look at them, note down at the, you know, the length of time, 
and then rewater and then repeat. And so uh, you can try this with different varieties to see whether your particular varieties are more or less susceptible to those stresses. And you can also use this technique to sort of calibrate your, your staff. So, so by the time you know, you've got to the end of this, you should be able to pick up a pot and say, okay, that's 285 grams. And, and you, won't be, you won't be far wrong. It's, it's amazing how quickly we learn. So, so very quickly now, just to finish, uh, we had hoped to present some results of applying RDI to packed bedding because that's a, an important part of PO22. We had uh, arranged or scheduled to do experiments in April, and of course we were unable to do those due to, to the lockdown. And so um, we're currently starting that work now. And we're having to use a different approach because most of the moisture sensors that we use they're, they're too large, too bulky to use with packed bedding. And so we're, we're going to use a system then uh, that allows us to calculate crop coefficients. And then we can combine the crop coefficients with, with uh, forecasts of temperature, humidity, and vapor pressure deficit then to schedule RDI to those packed bedding uh, uh, plants. And so um, that's the idea. Hopefully when we, uh, perhaps the next webinar or when we meet in person then, we'll be able to show you some of the results from, from the work with packed bedding. So just to say, as I think Wayne mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've used RDI on lots of different crops, lots of different species, sometimes to reduce height control, but often to try and deliver these other benefits, such as better uniformity, improved quality, improved flavor, uh, extended shelf life. And so you'll see there some examples on potted herbs, on, on field-grown lettuce, obviously a lot of work on soft root, I also work done many years ago on on H and S varieties, so it's quite a uh, quite a powerful technique that can be extended beyond uh, beyond protected uh, ornamentals, of course. And so, who can help? Oh, I think we've got the last poll question there. So, so having heard me talking about the benefits of RDI and uh, and and the challenges uh, and and some of the solutions, just interested to see how many of you will be willing to take a few of your plants and just dry them down and just, just see how long it takes before you see visible wilting. I think the poll's open again. I'm hoping it's a 100% answer again, Wayne. Well, it's very interesting, Mark. It's a very strong yes. We've, we've actually got 79% of those who voted saying yes, uh, and 14% saying, well, have a think about it. So, yeah, very positive. Excellent. Good. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm cheered by that, by that result. Thank you. So, so, who can help? Well, a lot of this work is based uh, on, on research we're doing at the moment in the current uh, PO22 project, and you can see our, our partners here on screen. So I think all of them, I can speak on their behalf, all of them would be quite happy to, to help you understand some of the challenges, some of the risks, and how you might implement uh, these sort of techniques on, on your nursery. Uh, uh, but in the, in the meantime, if you'd like more information or, or just like to have a conversation about how you might start, my email address is there on the bottom of the screen. So please feel free to email me or to contact Wayne um, or any of the consortium members, I'm sure would be very happy to help. And so. Finally, just to say thank you. And so um, thank you to colleagues past and present. Uh, thank you to my team at East Marling, to the consortium we have for PO22, and of course to AHTB for funding, uh, funding this research. And, and, and we hope to be able to uh, be in a situation next year where we can visit nurseries and talk to the growers and they can explain to you in person uh, the challenges and the advantages and the things you need to look out for uh, uh, when you're applying RDI to your crops. And so I'll, I'll finish there, but I'd be quite happy to answer any questions if there are any. We've, we've had a few, uh, Mark, and we are running a little behind, but I, only, I think it's only fair to sort of pose some questions to you as I did to Jill. So the okay. first one, quite an interesting one, uh, with the many variations in growing media, watering systems and sensors, could we use a vapor pressure deficit to determine watering intervals? So that's exactly what we're going to do. Was well, that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years, is um, with a view to using vapor pressure deficit to schedule schedule precision irrigation. So we're matching demand with supply, and also to schedule RDI. And so we got to the point in the last couple of years where I could very accurately predict how much water the plants would 
lose over the next two to three days and how much they lost over the last two to three days, looking at this combination of crop coefficients and vapor pressure deficit. And of course, the vapor pressure deficit then allows us to scale this up over the whole nursery. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the work with pack bedding uh, that will start very soon. OK, a uh, quick one about um, can you tell us more about the wireless balance? Yeah, this is a new a new balance that um, the 30 megahertz, our, um, one of our partners, is, is is providing this year. And so the idea is then um, the best thing you can do is have an inexpensive balance so you can weigh water loss directly. But of course, it's very uh, helpful to have that data um, available remotely. And so we're just about to install a wireless balance at, at Marcel's nursery so we can begin to track in real time the rate of water loss under under these different vapor pressure deficits. So hopefully, hopefully next year we'll have certainly have some results from using that system, and hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate the use of one of those balances on our on our partners' growing sites. I think what I'll do is I'll try and combine the next two questions together because they, they they are related, and it's to do with growing media mixes and nutrition nutrient delivery. Uh, yeah. What what part does substrate type type playing planning in RDI and is there a need to adjust nutrition with RDI? So yeah, so so you'll remember the graph I showed you that the, that the team at NEEM needed where there were three different bars and they were three different poinsettia mixes that, that we were testing two or three years ago. So so RDI was equally effective in each of those mixes, but of course it is important that the mix you have uh, is able to re-wet uh, when we want to re-wet the crop. And so it's important to talk to your you know, to your advisors and certainly Bullrush and, and, and colleagues will be able to advise on the correct substrate uh, mix or the optimum substrate mix. But it does work with every mix we've tested so far. In terms of nutrition, I think probably yes, we do need to tweak the nutrition because if you think in, a, in let's say throughout the month of October last year, we applied five irrigation events to, to Marcel's crop of poinsettia that you can see here in the photograph. Uh, the commercial uh, crop then had probably 10 or 11 irrigation events and so of course by reducing the number of irrigation events we were also reducing the opportunity to to feed the crop and i think you noticed wayne when you came to see that the the poinsettia crop that had been um, subjected to rdi I believe just looked a little paler and even though we um we carried out a nutrient analysis and we couldn't see any changes in bulk concentration there was definitely a difference in in leaf color now now, when we re-irrigated the crop and returned them to, uh, to normal, uh, by the time we got to dispatch, those differences in leaf coloration had, had disappeared. But I think there is a piece of work to do to understand how to optimize the application of nutrients during the time that we're imposing the RDI stress. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and then one, one final question just to draw it all to a close. Uh, do you feel that irrigation to floor grown crops, bedding, et cetera, uh, will be uniform enough to 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 uh, enforce an effective RDI? So in some cases, yes, and I think in some cases it might be a challenge. And of course, the the thing to do is to is for the growers to to um, to measure the variability across their growing areas. And it, and it may well be they see a gradient in in irrigation efficiency across the growing area. And and so once if that's if that's present and the, and they can see that, then it then becomes easier to work out how to accommodate that in, in, in applying the treatment. So the, the most important thing is to understand the level of variability in, in your different growing systems. And then you can start to make informed decisions on, on how to uh, impose treatments um, that can for that variability. Thank you, Mark. Um, if I could just ask Maya, just to sort of pass uh, the transition back to myself, I've just got one last slide to sort of pull this all together. Um, Hopefully, you'll be able to sort of see my. Uh, there. Uh, that's the one. Uh, so it goes without saying. Thank you to uh, both um, Jill and, and and Mark for their their, their presentations, and uh, for the time and effort they've put into bringing them together. Uh, for the duration of the next few seconds, while I'm wrapping up with this slide if you do need to download the basis neuroso form or handout please do so now before uh, we, we close up and wrap up this session um, any further questions if you think of anything in the next couple of days 
please submit it to me directly. Uh, my email address is there and I'll pass it on to uh, the appropriate presenter and hopefully uh, I'll get the response back to you in due course. As I said before, if you were, if you joined us late or if you do need to have a recording to pass on to other people, uh, please uh, uh, be aware that it, it, it will be available on our archive web, web page uh, next week. It will be loaded up there and we'll announce that in some sort of email shot to everybody. And as Jill inferred to in her presentation, we do have a, another AHDB horticulture webinar next Tuesday. Uh, I think it's Tuesday morning on uh, foliar disease control in autumn bedding, where the ADAS team will go through the various uh, control measures for a wide range of foliar diseases. So with that, I, as I say, I'd just like to thank everybody for their presentations and I wish everybody uh, a, a good evening and safe journey home if you're still at work. So thank you for that, Maya. Thank you very much.